afternoon and welcome to the second session in our autumn term morning webinar series by the Institute of International Monetary Research in collaboration with the Vincent Center at the University of Buckingham. I'm Dr. Juan Castaneda, Director of the IMR, and today we'll be hosting Peter Schwartz. Dr. Peter Schwartz is a Professor of Economics at Camilo José Cela University in Madrid. From September 20, 2014 to September 2016, he was the President of the Montpellier Society, of which he is a member since 1978. He's a bachelor and doctor in law uh, at the University Complutense of Madrid and a Master of Economics and a PhD in Political Thought at the London School of Economics. When a member of the Intelligence Department of the Bank of Spain, he directed the History Division specializing in monetary history. At the four Spanish universities where he has taught, he was a professor of the History of Economic Thought. He has also been visiting professor at the University of Buckingham. He belongs to the board of the Spanish think tank Civismo, to the academic advisory board of the Institute of Economic Affairs in London. He's a member of Liberals Institute in Zurich and of the European Center of Austrian Economics. In the US, he's a, a scholar of the Cato Institute, and he has been given an honorary doctorate by Universidad Francisco Marroquín in Guatemala in 2015. He's also a member of the Real Academia de Ciencias Morales y Políticas of Spain, Dr. Svartz uh, also helped introduce the Santander uh, University's uh, university program in the UK. There is uh, plenty more he has done. He's also a member of the Institute's uh, Academic Advisory Council. Peter Schwartz uh, uh, will discuss today monetarism in a historical perspective and why is it not fashionable anymore? Petro, we are very grateful for, for your continued support to the Institute, for accepting our invitation to to, to deliver uh, a webinar for us. And uh, uh, we are delighted to host you and uh, the floor is entirely yours. Thank you very much. I am going to uh, speak or turn to the question, monetarism, why unfashionable? It's really extraordinary that a theory that uh, has a long pedigree going back to the 16th century, when gold and silver came into Castile and pushed prices up, that this idea, the idea that there's a connection between the supply of money, in this case, the supply of broad money, and the price level, uh, is something that most people in the profession reject, and especially the people in charge of the different central banks reject. Now, I'm going to divide this lecture into two. One is to go into the quantity theory of money and prices and show that there's, there's logic to it and that it isn't a mad idea. And it's still worth it though it's a very old one, an idea of many centuries. And then I will turn to, to uh, the question, if the quantity theory has at least to be considered, if not uh, understood properly, considered, then why do so many people reject it? Why do the uh, governors of different central banks and also the main, main professionals uh, reject this theory? Now, I'm not going to go into proving or looking at the relationship between money and, uh, and the, the growth of, of nominal GDP, because that's uh, been done in the Institute of Monetary, Institute of International Monetary Research very well. I'm simply giving you a, a glimpse of what it is. And here we have on this chart, we have different countries and different uh, uh, growth, growth rates of uh, nominal GDP and of the, of the, the amount of money, the price of, uh, of the amount of money, the price of, uh, of, um, <clears throat> of M4, uh, and then we can see that in the different countries at different times, it really fits. So there must be something about the quantity theory, which isn't quite bad, isn't something that should be rejected. Uh, let's have a look at why I think it's not so bad a theory. Central bankers have made it clear that they do not believe in or use the possible connection between money supply and inflation. Also, their diagnosis of inflation takes little or no account of the early warning of some prices that are not in the, uh, in the usual measure of inflation, 
prices of um, assets, such as stocks and real estate, they are the first ones to go up. And so central banks should have a look at it and uh, so prepare for what's coming later in the consumption uh, in, in indices. And they also work usually with closed economy models, especially in some third, third world countries, the, uh, the idea is that one can manage the foreign sector uh, while increasing the amount of money and there's no problem there. We shall see an example of, of the, the contrary. The money, also, the monetary theory of balance of payments is important. The Fisher identity, which we will see a lot of, uh, MV equal PY. And the Fisher identity is really a model of a closed economy. But let's remember, think of, for a moment, the case of Sri Lanka and modern monetary theory. Now, Abelana in 1945, uh, a great analytical economist and uh, and uh, misguided political economists, I should say, said that uh, the monopoly of fiat money that uh, central banks have allow them to push as much money as they want into the economy because up to the point that it becomes uh, fully employed. And if there's any problem on the, in the balance of payments, then a flexible exchange rate will deal with that. So, you can decide that you want to increase employment by increasing the amount of money almost with no limit. Now, what happened in Sri Lanka? That the government uh, applied this idea of the modern monetary theory, applied it uh, really to, to the hilt uh, and helped it too with a ban on chemical fertilizers. So uh, the economy of Sri Lanka didn't, wasn't producing enough tea or enough, or enough rice to feed itself. Uh, or to sell abroad, and in the end, they ran out of dollars. And by running out of dollars, they couldn't buy medicines, they couldn't buy anything abroad. So the idea that one should put the quantity theory within the uh, framework of the balance of payments is something that will stay there in the background because I'm going to do something else. Now, now I'm going to see at three central banks. One, the, uh, the Fed, Powell declared in December 2021, seven hearings that the connection between money and inflation had ended 40 years ago. Well, that's a surprising thing to say. Uh, what it means, I think, is that the mainland economists did not find a stable connection in their econometric tests between M0 and P. Uh, by using M0, that is the uh, high-powered money, they missed what the, the real cause is of inflation, which is M3 and M4. So those economists took no account of the delayed effects or saw them as random. The European Central Money, uh, Castaneda and Sendejas have quoted from the ECB's overview of monetary strategy. The ECB holds that in the empirical link between money and inflation has weakened. They don't say it's gone, gone away 40 years ago, but weakened. And the important question now is a transmission mechanism between what the central bank does with high-powered money and the, the economy, not only prices, but the economy. So there's an authoritarian emphasis on the transmission mechanism. It implies a belief that M0 rather than uh, broad money is the principal variable to be watched. The money supply is to be reckoned with. The Bank of England also, uh, I've looked at the Inflation Report Bank of England, which now has changed its name to Monetary Policy Report. Perhaps it, they don't like the word inflation any, anymore. The Bank of England has defined inflation as rises in, consume, in the consumer price index and hopes that higher interest rates will lead people to spend less. I see, I shall say something about uh, the instrument of interest rates. It should be sustained rises in inflation, not peaks. Uh, for a time, all central bankers were saying, this, this inflation is going to go away very quickly. Uh, no, the point is, how can we explain the continued increase in prices? And the Bank of England doesn't mention money. It isn't there. Uh, 
and the new name and the new report of August 2022 says inflation is mainly due to energy prices caused by the war in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine started in February 2022. Inflation started a year before in 2021. So it's a curious case of the cause coming after the effect. Now, the quantity identity, many people are, uh, are familiar with it, but I still go on to explain it because, uh, because of the people who don't believe it. So it should be called the quantity of money theory of the price level, which is what we, we do. But the monetary model is composed of two parts. There's, there's an identity and there's a theory. The identity, the Fisher identity as it's called, establishes the framework of monetary's explanation of inflation. And uh, it's, uh, it is, as, as, is, as is well known, uh, it's M times V, the velocity, the supply of money, N times V, uh, identical to P times Y, where T is the translation for Y there. As for M, it should be broad money, as John Stuart Mill proposed in 1848 uh, during the discussion between uh, his, pre his masters in economics. And attention to money supply has therefore a long pedigree. <clears throat> now, the quantity theory, not, um, not the quantity identity, the quantity theory is a theory about prices. It says that the price is equal to broad money supply times the velocity divided by nominal income. Uh, or in rates of growth, we can do it. We will use rates of growth in, in our mind, but we won't go into that now. <clears throat> the, so there we have what is usual in economics, a supply and a demand. The supply is M3 times V, and the demand in the, in the, in the dividing is why the nominal um, the nominal uh, income um, national income now it's there's a there's two problems here one about v velocity if velocity is goes all over the place and you can't model it and you don't know what pushes it uh, especially in terms of inflation then the quantity theory doesn't work but if you can model it then it's a different thing i'll say something now about it now uh, too much, the people say too much money chasing too few goods. Exactly, you have too much money, there's the demand for money, uh, the, the supply of money, uh, chasing the demand for money, the demand for money that you use in, in nominal income. Now, we have a first problem, which people don't, quantitativists don't look at properly, which is, does an increase in M3 make for an increase in nominal income? Yes. Does it lead to an increase in real income? What's the connection between nominal income and real income? After all, we don't eat banknotes. We eat uh, cornflakes and uh, meat. Uh, and therefore, what we need is to know something about M3 and nominal income. And what, what I think is that growth comes from savings and investments, not from monetary expansion, and certainly not from um, expansion of supply of money by the central bank. Um, but a predictable value of money along the years helps investment by foresight and helps growth. So the connection is an indirect one, but a very important one, especially in favor of having a stable supply of money. Now, velocity here, this is, this is the question, the stumbling block of many people or many uh, heads of central banks. It's a crucial unknown that should be specified if we wish to predict the effect of M of M3 on P. The income velocity of money or the inverse or the demand for money has to be defined. If not, it's the jolly joker in the central banker's hand. It moves all over the place, so we can't predict uh, because it, it interferes. The vagaries of V are usually presented as random phenomena a random phenomenon that upsets the calculation of future inflation. Now, the play of expectations also complicates, uh, complicates V. But if it is possible to model velocity as Castaneda and Sendejas have done, then uh, there'll, there'll be, and the expectations adapt to reality in the end, then central banks 
uh, could, can say, do something about inflation and indeed predict it. Modeling velocity, the velocities in the long run returns to the mean, say, show uh, Castanians and Dejas. The secular trend is a fall in velocity. There's two elements velocity. One is about the monetary situation and monetary expectations. And the other one is about the um, deepening of the financial sector. So financial innovation tends to make the velocity, the mean velocity fall. In the shorter run, variations in velocity away from the mean trend are an indication of disequilibrium. That, this is an important idea, but because uh, that's the way we economists work. We have the, the supply of money, we have the demand of money. If they don't fit together, if they are not equal, then velocity changes. So velocity is what, what makes for the uh, equilibrium of demand and supply in money. In equilibrium, uh, log V is equal to zero, and so what we have is m, uh, uh, m times uh, m times one. Um, it's not say m one. It's m times one divided by y. So that m three directly influences inflation in the long run. Uh, Castaneda and Sendeh has found seventy years of years data. The first inkling that there's an effect of monetary expansion of prices will take something like uh, two quarters delay. But once it's there, when the effect is being seen, then it can last for a year or a year and a half or two, which is what is happening at present. So in sum, the quantity theory holds because velocity has become tractable. Central banks ignore it at their peril. Present day inflation could have been better managed. Well, indeed, I, I was sick of hearing this was a short inflation, for sure. Of course, it was going to be short. Uh, no problem. The, let's not do something about it. But it, it hasn't been showed because we have a theory that tells us how, uh, how prices will increase uh, in, in a continued way if you have fed the economy with too much money and keep feeding it with that. So if the quantity theory holds, the question is, why are central bankers blind to these two conclusions? Well, it's happened, they are blind, but, but why? I don't have an answer, a very fast answer, but I'm going to go into it and see what, you, what, uh, what people think of what I say and also what questions I will receive after the lecture. So why do central bankers mismanage inflation? Now, I've read the, um, two weeks ago an extraordinary paper by, uh, um, by, um, oh, oh, um, by uh, uh, a professor in, in, the, uh, uh, in, foreign, in foreign affairs. I remember his name, I'm very sorry. But his explanation is based on supply shock coming from the 2007 2008 financial crisis. As the war in as the war in Ukraine magnified by supply chain problems explains, uh, explains inflation. Also, large scale public spending with ultra low interest rates at the origin also helps inflation. So, what he says, we have to use uh, we have to use uh, uh, the interest rates to uh, we have to use interest rates to try and, and govern inflation, rein it in, uh, and but it's very, one must be very careful because you increase inflation, then you lower growth. And if you allow growth, you have, you have, uh, you have more inflation. <clears throat> and, and therefore, he, uh, Rogoff, I'm sorry, the name is Rogoff. Rogoff is a very famous and uh, respected economist. I've studied him a lot because of also his uh, forays into history. Rogoff. Uh, says that inflation comes from supply shocks, from public spending, and one should be careful not to rein it in too quickly. So one of the reasons why central bankers and the profession don't properly take account of broad money supply is because of bad theory. 
and there are three uh, elements of bad theory. Um, the first, the, the central bankers believe that money is an instrument of real growth. So among other things, not only does it some effect on finances of a, of a country or an economy, but it also helps to make the economy grow. Now, this has been called uh, ever since uh, Mr. Professor Phillips at the last week of said it, the Phillips curve, the belief that a degree of inflation will cure unemployment. Now, after Friedman, we know they will choose, choose it for a time, but then the, uh, then, uh, the uh, natural rate of unemployment shifts and in the Phillips curve is very short lived, not even for a year, the effects of the Phillips curve effects of uh, supply of money. So loose monetary policy, uh, policy and, and easy credit would make countries recover from COVID. Now that's a central idea. For central bankers, the, for central bankers, the supply of money is very important because it helps people be better off, countries to be better off and grow. So easy money combined from, from with public debt is a recipe for reindustrializing and modernizing the economy. We have that from the, uh, from the um, European Commission. They now have proposed uh, huge amounts of money to be put into new generation problem. Uh, it's 806 billion, uh, billion euros, this program. Why? Because they think that with giving easy money to the economy, then the economy will recover from a recession and, and grow very fast. <clears throat> and second bad theory. Mistaken inflation theory makes people forget that as Milton Friedman said, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon in the sense that it is and can only be produced by a more rapid increase in the quantity of money than in output. So we have the top of the fraction, which is M times V divided by Y is what happens if M times V goes up, then nominal income, nominal national income will go up. So it's not once and for all price rises. Uh, they are not inflation. It's continued price rises that are brought about by <clears throat> excessive money creation. Now, if you have a peak in, in inflation because in prices, because uh, you've had um, a war in Crimea or you've had COVID or whatever, then you shouldn't forget what Marshall, uh, what Marshall explained, which is the substitutes and the complements of a rising of a, of a good that rises in price. Substitutes, if you if you uh, uh, have um, petrol going up or oil going up, then the, the price of bicycles, which are a substitute, will go up. But the price of cars will tend to go down because a car is, is a complement of the supply of, of petrol. So it's only validation by a generous monetary policy that will prolong the effects of rising costs on the price level, not on some goods that can be substituted or have an effect on other goods that are their complements. Bad theory three, no less than three. Uh, now the instrument of interest rates is a hangover from the gold standard bank rate changes uh, in the defend of the gold reserve. That was in the 19th century Bank of England, uh, uh, Bank of England policy. Now, interest rates are a, uh, an ambiguous instrument. They are cause and effect of money. High market rates can indicate a bubble and not central banking policy. And Keynes, um, we must remember, had no confidence in his rates in the, because of the animal spirits, which is a way to, that he spoke about velocity. And animal spirits are very unpredictable. Now, deficit spending, spending even in trillions, though they, though, though they say so, uh, has no effect on no direct effect in inflation. It's an effect in as far as it includes broad money expansion. Broad money growth is a strategic instrument, not the interest rates. Monetary policy always dominates fiscal policy as for the uh, 
putting funds to make an economy grow. Central banks are making a dangerous mistake when they increase rates while fall, failing to reduce or maintain money growth, because you can easily have high rates and low, uh, uh, and low growth. And Tim Congdon warns that we're in danger now, at this moment, of sending the world's economy into a recession by exclusively using interest rates to bend inflation and not paying enough attention to the fall in broad money. For broad money is falling, and that will have an effect on why on nominal income. Now, another three, three uh, mistakes, theoretical mistakes. First, another of my suggestions for explaining the fact that uh, the central bankers and, and the profession don't look at money at all is monetary policy time lags. These lags make central bankers lose confidence in the quantity theory. Milton Freeman used to reckon the changes in the stock of money proceed by something like 12 to 16 months uh, the, the, of the business, business cycle. And, and uh, we, we, we just mentioned uh, Castaneda and Sendejas that once after two quarters we feel the effect of an increase in money, then it can last for years. Central bank governors and economists need more immediate results, especially if you are to be elected. They want to be able to have an effect on growth and have an effect on prices very quickly. So this discretionary monetary policy is impatient. They want to manage and have the results immediately. And since the quantity theory takes time, quite a lot of time to percolate through the, the economy, then they don't look at it anymore. And they, don't, uh, they, uh, they see that their models and economic models don't reflect this relationship. Now, people, central bankers have high hopes to be able to carry out an anti-cyclical monetary policy. In the name of reindustrialization, central bankers will be inclined to back intervention fiscal policies accompanied by cheap money, uh, helping to lower the interest costs of such plans. More generally, there will be a political inclination to alleviate public debt situations in some countries that you have in, the, in all around the Mediterranean, um, because those countries that have too much debt, uh, it, is, it is said or examined, should have a special dispensation to allow them to survive. And so if the connection between supply of broad money and the real economy, that explains in part the uh, blindness of central bankers to the supply of money. Another one. So I had three, three, uh, uh, three uh, theoretical uh, mistakes. Then the idea that you can influence reality and make economy the economy grow really with uh, continuous production of money, and then public choice. This is a Big, uh, big field, which should be we should try and and explain by looking at, uh, at different situations, different central banks. Uh, when uh, Sidney Fisher wrote uh, a very good uh, paper uh, on rules and discussion, whether we should have rules or discussion for central bank policy, then he uh, Milton Freeman said, "This is. I feel that you are." This is Hamlet without the prince. From revealed preference, I suspect that by far and away, the two most important variables in the loss function, that is the, the function of, of keeping an eye on inflation, are avoiding accountability on the one hand and achieving public prestige on the other. So there's a whole lot of causes that have to do with public choice, the public choice situation of the governors of central banks. They are public spirit indeed, but their public spirit means they have to tell or make the, uh, the politicians behave properly because then they will fulfill their hopes, public hopes that the economy will go well. So it's a matter of conscience and also a matter of career. Uh, I will 
I hope in, in these few months, uh, be able to receive, uh, to receive uh, suggestions of how public choice is influencing, influences monetary policy. Uh, public choice means politicians uh, pressing on the central bank to have an increase in money supply just before an election. And then after the election saying, oh, we, we are very orthodox and now we have to expunge inflation from the system. Uh, uh, so that's political influence. Then there's career influence, as we say. And this is a, a whole uh, field of research, which I, after being asked to, to, to try and explain why um, monetary, monetary money is not looked at by central bankers, I would like to, uh, to explore. So this uh, um, article by Stanley Fisher, it's a 1988 one, uh, not very recent, but still very, very interesting, <clears throat> examines <clears throat> several administrative and institutional means to make central bankers' private interests coincide with the legal objectives of central bankers. So, as we shall see now, the central bankers now are being given objectives, inflation objectives, uh, which they have to attain. And so there are different institutional means to help the central bank governors uh, do what they are told by, uh, by the rule. So one way uh, of, getting, uh, of, of getting central bankers uh, behave is to do so openly by setting a rule, such as the Taylor rule, as an overt connection by which to judge the performance of the bank. And we remember what, what used to be the case in New Zealand, when the, the, the governor of the central bank, his, uh, his, uh, his salary was reduced, the, the rate of inflation was above uh, the aim that had been set to the bank. Milton Freeman proposes K percent rule, which advocates a constant yearly expansion of the monetary base. Uh, this is the idea behind it is keep money as steady, money supply as steady as you can, so that the calculations of, the, of people in the economy are not upset, and then they will make the economy grow due to the institutions, due to uh, savings and investment and technological advance. So the idea of Milton Freeman is let's not play with money, let's try and keep it stable. And more generally, uh, another, another way, another uh, way to stop uh, central bankers uh, not, not, not doing what they should do, looking at inflation, is uh, to, to make central banks independent from politics and politicians. Well, uh, it has been established throughout the world with failing success, but I, I, I don't, I don't, uh, the, so Stanley Fisher discusses this uh, and how difficult it is to set a rule that will take into account the, the bumps from the real economy. And Fisher also presents a very, very interesting game where the achieving or losing of reputation is a possible element uh, in avoiding conflicts between the political interests and the avoidance of inflation, inflationary policies. Now, the, <clears throat> I followed I followed a seminar Cato uh, in uh, September this year, and uh, one of the persons there was uh, Power, who gave a speech and said this very extraordinary thing. We now understand better how little we know about inflation. Well, my goodness, uh, how, if central banks don't know about inflation, how can they, how can they properly perform their, their role? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a confession uh, which I, I, find, I find surprising. And if I, if I had to do it, I would go back home and try and understand what is, what is happening and uh, not uh, stay in a situation of ignorance. Uh, I've insisted on the longer term connection between M4 or bull money and nominal GDP. 
it is the case, I think, that monetary authorities cannot determine real variables like output and employment. Uh, two reflections of this. A, the Taylor rule, which uses, uh, uses uh, <clears throat> equilibrium rates of unemployment and equilibrium interest rates, is very difficult to apply. The Taylor rate is a result, the Taylor rule is, is a result of the observation of what central banks used to do, the Fed used to do, but it's very difficult to use it forward to predict or to change the course of, of prices. So um, what we have there is the, the Taylor rule doesn't use it, as they call it, starred, uh, uh, starred variables, which uh, are difficult to, to know. Then there's been a suggestion that we should, uh, we should target nominal gross domestic product. This is a, exactly what we were saying before, that it's not only prices, it's also the gross, the, the, the income, if, uh, the income uh, expressed in money or money income that should be targeted. So I have little hope that central bankers and the professional will turn their eyes again to the quantity theory. Thank you very much. Thank you.